Good evening. It's an honor to be with you. And we are going to take a rather deep dive this evening into some things most of us would prefer not to think about. Um, welcome to my world. I am a Christian psychologist, and I have worked with the, commu with the Christian community for 50 years next year. I believe he himself called me to this work that I do, and it is a grievous work. I see many who have been oppressed, raped, trampled underfoot, abused, and battered, and sadly, the vast majority of them have treated, been treated this way by other Christians, followed by those who often purposefully covered it up or were quietly complicit. I want you to grasp what I just said. No one in this room wants it to be true. Neither do the people who covered it up. Within the space of power and pulpits and high places, I have encountered abuse, violence, extensive deception, and trauma since the beginning of my career in 1972. Along with the victims of such things, I have also worked with Christian pastors and leaders. Many came because they were burnt out or just struggling with the loads that they carried, feeling very isolated. Unknown to me, such experiences with victims and pastors were to eventually collide in my career and give me an intensive study in power and deception. Sometime during my first two years of clinical work, I sat down with a young woman who was in her early 20s who bent over and took her long hair and tossed it over her face in order to hide. And for the first time in life, my life, I heard the words, my father did weird things to me. I had absolutely no idea what she was talking about. Those were the years before public or professional discussion of childhood sexual abuse. And when I went to a supervisor about the young woman, I was told that women sometimes tell these hysterical stories and your job is not to get hooked by them. You will contribute to their pathology if you believe what they say. As other stories were told to me over time, I ultimately made a decision to believe the women rather than the supervisor, which I suppose tells you something about me. It was, in fact, the supervisor who was deceived, not the women. And then I began hearing about rape and domestic violence, and I began to understand that sexual abuse and domestic violence are just different faces of this thing we call violence, abuses of power, traumatic to experience, and acts full of and often covered by layers of deceit, often in the name of God. Needless to say, those experiences were profoundly shaping Unknown to me, I was being taught by God through desperate people to swim against the current. He was teaching me to heed his voice, no matter what others were saying. And he began to teach me about his love of truth, even when it's ugly. His character of integrity and his longing that that be emulated in his followers. He showed me that to be a member of or a leader of a church, even an esteemed one, does not necessarily mean that a person's citizenship is actually in heaven. He taught me that this lovely word truth, something he embodied, sometimes means speaking about or exposing hideous things, and that he is not surprised by, nor does he ever minimize evil. In fact, evil is the cancer that kills his people. Many at that time said that such abuse could not be happening. Victims were looking for attention. I was being sucked in and deceived. Post-traumatic stress disorder was not a diagnostic category until 1980. That was eight years after I sat with the young woman. I learned over time that violence silences and deceives human beings both victim and perpetrator, and other witnesses as well. And I began to understand that deception is soul deadening and produces despair. Deception is what ruined human beings in the very beginning. Relentless abuse and injustice mars the image of God in humans and makes them 
far less than who God created them to be. In fact, relentless oppression, always supported by deception, can make oppressors out of victims. So while we talk together over the few days I'm here, we will be looking at the topics of power and deception and the church, words that should not belong together. We will consider the issues of power and deception because we sadly know that the abuse of power does exist in Christ Christian homes, in organizations and churches, and has often been covered up sometimes for decades. We did not know and do not know to believe that we, that we do not want to believe that abuse exists. We certainly don't want to believe that it is in the homes that are represented in our pews. And we never want it to be believed that it is in the church carried out by and covered up by church leaders. Sadly, it has taken the secular media and courts to make it abundantly clear that abuse is in all such places and has even been perpetrated or covered up by some we have held in high esteem. I am grieved that it has been the media and not the people of God who have dragged this to the light. Consider this story. A young woman was growing up in a home that was a bit chaotic and her parents were continually stressed. They had many children, money was tight, and mom suffered from depression. The little girl was lonely. A friend at school invited her to come to church. They had a great youth group, she said, and the young pastor who ran it was energetic and warm, and he had a very pretty wife. She loved it. She went weekly for months. The youth pastor was lots of fun and taught them about God, and she was hungry to know more. The youth pastor paid attention to her and offered to teach her individually so she could learn more about God. And he would take her and get her a sandwich and listen and answer her questions. It was wonderful. She felt special to the youth pastor, but more importantly, she felt special to God. And then one day it got weird. The youth pastor started talking about how special she was and how he wanted to see more of her. He started touching her. She didn't like it but was afraid to say so. She thought maybe she misunderstood. Eventually, one day, he drove her home, and on their way down a dirt road, he forced her into sex. She was terrified, in pain. I think we rightly name that act rape. Not a mistake. She was 13. She tried to tell her friend from school and church the mother's friend went to the senior pastor of the church, but he never spoke to her. No one asked her questions. And one day when she went to church, a lady in the church sat down beside her and said she probably should stop coming because they did not want her to be there to damage the youth pastor's good reputation. Her friends quit talking to her, even at school. And she read in the paper many years later that the youth pastor had been arrested. It turned out she was not the only one. No one came to speak with her about it then. She'd never told her story. 20 years later, she sits in a row pew, back row pew in your church, hungry still for the God she longed for at 13 and terrified, certain that her search will result in more hurt and denial and silence it took tremendous courage to even cross the threshold of the church and wonder what others would say if they knew her story. She's afraid to hear about God and what he thinks, and yet still remains hungry for his love. Will she ever hear the truth about sexual abuse from your pulpit or from a class at church? How do you think she would feel if someone in authority, particularly a male, asked to meet with her? Would anyone hear her story and be able to say they believe her and know someone who understands and could perhaps actually help her? What are the lessons of the church for this woman? That it is a place to worship God, a refuge, a sanctuary, that sheep can safely graze inside its walls, that truth is taught and desired, that godliness is sought after and sin is dealt with no matter where it's found? that there's a safe place for little ones and people 
who seek to do nothing to hinder them, but come along and feed them and protect them from wolves? Or have we made the Father's house a den of robbers, which literally means a safe place for those who steal? With this story in mind, let's look at what we mean by power. Where does it come from and how is it expressed? The word power means having the capacity to do something, to have an effect, to, the, to influence people or events, to have authority. As those created in the image of God of all power, we too have power. He gave it to us, even our little ones. A hungry infant can drag two exhausted adults out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. That is power. Power is present in every human. And God says, let us make humans in our image and let them rule. Rule is a power word. It means things like decree or require or demand. We were designed by God to have power. We bear his image. He has all power. He gave us limited power. And we are to rule and bear fruit in his likeness with the power that he gave us. In essence, God created us in his image, thereby multiplying his likeness on the earth. This God who is faithful, loving, truth itself, and a refuge made us so that we would replicate his character on the earth. We are to make his likeness manifest, to make it clear. Our God-given power was purposed to unveil the character of God himself and bless his world. When you sit with people and teach them or listen to them, you are in essence to be a living model of the character of Jesus Christ. You invite their truths, no matter how ugly they are, into your life and listen, and you live truth out of your own life. Power presents in many forms. Verbal power is an obvious one. We use words to define and manage and control situations and other people. It includes silence, withholding words when they are needed, which we often call the silent treatment. Words and silence can both be used for good or ill. Verbal power, our words, are meant to bring blessing and truth. You think of the woman I described. Verbal power was both misused and covered up. There was no love, no kindness, and no truth in the words spoken or in the silence. Another kind of power is emotional power. It can be demonstrated by empathy or comfort or love toward another. It can also be the power of rage, anger, and fear or condemnation to control or silence another. We have all had the experience of taking another's emotional temperature in order to decide how we should speak or act in their presence. Damaging responses to others' feelings can be humiliating to them, shaming another, who is afraid or grieving can crush them. Perpetrators often use seemingly good emotions in order to ensnare another, such as the youth pastor did in our example. The most obvious form of power is physical. The bigger and stronger have power over the smaller and the weaker. It can also be a physical movement without words, such as someone curling their fists and silently staring. It is a threatening physical movement with a message. And you hit a spouse once, then just raising your fist has remarkable power. It can also be a physical presence that can fill a room, a strong personality that can control a room, a company, or even a nation. Knowledge is a kind of power, as is position. Think about sitting with the doctor and he's going to have some tests made to see the source of your symptoms or pain. And he's not only going to give you the results, but he's going to interpret them for you. And he's going to tell you what treatment is necessary if it is. And depending on the outcome, 
his or her knowledge and position and words could turn your whole life upside down. And because of the knowledge and position, you most likely will listen and do what you are told, even if you're terrified. Doctors, professors, pastors all have combined power of knowledge and position to be used to bless or abuse, or to appear to bless in order to abuse, like our youth pastor. There's financial power. I can threaten your salary, your job, if you speak the truth. I can refuse you access to the accounts we ostensibly share. I can promise money if you do something wrong for me. There's financial abuse and threats in many marriages. There is financial abuse threats in many organizations. You want a paycheck so you can pay your bills and feed your family? Then you'll do what I say. Silence and absence are types of power. Silence about wrongdoing. A failure to speak truth can do terrible damage. The church was also utterly absent in terms of any care or support or comfort. Power can bless or manipulate. It can control and it can discard. The silence of humans has done that in many arenas, not just for individuals, but organizations and again, nations. And spiritual power, the using of God's words, the using of his name to control, shame, manipulate and intimidate leads to very confused minds and trampled hearts and a fear of God because they have been taught wrongly about him. God's own words can be used as a way of exploiting or crushing a very vulnerable person. In our example, the youth pastor used God's words to draw the girl in, to deceive her about herself and ultimately to do great damage to her life. He used his spiritual power to exploit her. The church used its spiritual words and power to blame her and cast her out. Obviously, power is a gift from God to humans given for the purpose of blessing his world and each other and demonstrating his likeness. Also obvious, it has been twisted and grossly misused by humans. It has been used in ways that are destructive of the image of God in other humans and that blaspheme God leaking down sometimes in families through the generations or leaking around the globe. It is critical that we understand the kinds of power that we have and consider how we use them. It looks like when it is abused that we have used our power, we convince ourselves, for something good. But when we really look at it and see what we've done, We've used something God gave us in wrong ways in order to protect ourselves or get what we want. All humans are vulnerable. We have power, but we're also vulnerable. And vulnerable simply means we're capable of being wounded. There's nobody in this room who is not capable of being wounded. We are all of us frail and finite. We often see vulnerability as a weakness, as if it were a defect. It's not a defect, it's just human. God is not vulnerable, at least not in heaven he's not. He was here on earth. Our capacity for being wounded is constant. We don't like it. We try to hide it, sometimes even from ourselves. Even while we take advantage of the vulnerabilities of other others, which gives us a feeling of power and makes us less feel less vulnerable. Sadly, we often blame the vulnerable for wounding others have done to them. You know, if only you had or had not done something, then it never would have happened. We've done this with rape victims, with domestic violence victims, many others. The exploitation of the vulnerable tells us about them, about the exploiter, not about the victim. God is very clear that what you and I do comes from our hearts, not from the person standing in front of us. When the pastor raped the girl, 
that was an expose of his heart. It was not something about her that made that happen. Whether it's evil thoughts, immorality, pride, many other things, they expect something about us and we pollute ourselves when we wound the vulnerable. We are exposed as ungodly. Our response to vulnerability tells us about ourselves, not about the vulnerable. Their vulnerability tells us about them and always calls for care and protection. Jesus' response to our vulnerability is worth studying. When he encountered blindness, which is certainly a vulnerable way to be, which the crowd again assumed was because the blind man had sinned. And if he hadn't, surely his parents had, otherwise he wouldn't be like that, right? Jesus opened his eyes and he said, the man had not sinned, nor had his parents. His vulnerability was the stage for God's work to be displayed. And it was displayed by Jesus Christ's response to that vulnerability. Given the impact of abuse on an individual life, on society and on the church, given the frequency of its occurrence, it is absolutely crucial that we as the church and the body of Christ are not silent. Not only does God call us not to be silent, he calls his church to be a refuge and a place for hope and healing. Anything less is a failure to demonstrate the character of Christ in this world. Our Father hates evil. That means our Father hates rape, sexual abuse, violence, and the exploitation of humans made in his image. We are to be like him. Our Lord, the God of all power, came to us vulnerable, a newborn, utterly dependent. He wore our vulnerability. You cannot be human and not be vulnerable, though many work hard to convince themselves and others otherwise. Jesus was devoured by wolves and viciously abused their power to exploit and crush him. He endured atrocities for you and for me. If we are to be the body of Christ, who truly follows our head, the good and great shepherd, then we will be a refuge for the flock, a place of green pastures and clear waters, a place of restoration for wounded sheep, and most certainly a place free of wolves. Both the secular and religious news have globally exposed the fact that not only are there wolves in our sheepfold, they have in the name of our God protected their place among God's sheep by complicity, cover up and deceit. We have used our individual and often our collective power to protect the institution of shepherding rather than the sheep. All sheep require a shepherd if they are to survive and flourish. We are all sheep, you and I, even when we are someone in power. And any power we have as a pastor, a parent, teacher, whatever, is a derivative of the power of our Lord who said that all power, no exception, has been given to him. That means whatever power you have, whether it's an ounce or 400 pounds, came from him to you to be used on his behalf. And when, when we think about something like clergy sexual abuse, you know, the word pastor actually comes from the Latin word for shepherd. And it means to lead to pasture, to tend and guard and protect. A shepherd is clearly nothing like a wolf. Everything a wolf does is purpose to isolate, separate, exploit the vulnerable. That is what our example pastor did. Everything the shepherd who follows the good shepherd does is purpose to protect, nurture, and guide those under his or her care. Jesus says, all power is mine. Therefore, go, looking like me, acting like me. So from what root does this terrible abuse of power spring? How do we get like that? 
The abuse of power comes from the inside by way of deceit. Go back to the beginning with me just for a minute. First, the enemy desired all power and sought to be like the Most High. The de desire itself is a complete deception, if you think about it. The enemy was a created creature. He was not self-sustaining. He deceived himself into thinking he could be the Most High and attain self-rule. In pursuit of that status, he sought to attain the subservience of humans whom he had not and could not create. He did so by taking the word of God and twisting it. As God said, he deceived using God's words so as to serve himself. It's a familiar and oft repeated pattern by human beings. We call it spiritual abuse today. Eve responded by believing, speaking truth, but she tacked a lie on. We're not eat or touch. Her response included a lie even as she spoke partial truth. She was already deceiving herself. The serpent suggests God lied. You're not going to die. You'll actually be more like him. And Eve decided the tree, which God had said no to, was actually good. So she ate some and gave it to another. And Adam and Eve told themselves that they were pursuing a greater likeness to God, which was their purpose. They failed to see or wrestle with the fact that they were pursuing God's likeness through ungodly means, which is something we have continued down through the centuries. Consider the recent demise of our ZIM. We were told years ago that his honorary doctorate was in fact an educational degree. It was an early deception. He was claiming the doctorate represented years of successful academic work. It did not. I suspect both Ravi and those around him chose to ignore the deception because after all, an academic degree from a globally respected institution would bolster a gospel apologetics ministry, which is a good thing, right? The lie would be used in service of the truth. God's truth, misnaming an honorary doctorate for the good of God's word, seems miles away from things like sexual abuse of an untold num uh, unknown number of victims from around the globe. It is not, because deceit is a narcotic that deadens us to wrongdoing. Once we start, it's really easy to add more. We then continue to inject the poison without distress. It will eventually kill us. It killed Adam and Eve. It brought many forms of death into the life and world of Ravi. His character was not one of truth, even as he spoke of teaching truth to the world. Deceit is a very strong narcotic. And deceit spreads. It's contagious. The one doing the deceiving becomes better at what they practice, and the deceptions multiply. The mechanism remains the same. You know, if people knew how hard I work, how tired I am, I need to be fed a certain fruit in order to continue God's work. It gets difficult, however, to carry around increasing deceptions and keep them hidden. Often the system then that surrounds the individual steps in and supports the deceptions. Why? Because it is the work of God and we cannot let that go down. As the deceptions become more frequent and victims become vocal, they must be discarded, maligned, and criticized because they are trying to destroy God's work. We humans have been deceiving ourselves from the beginning, and the disease infects us all. It breaks the heart of our God every time we do it. In naming his, it is ruining his world. It is destroying his people. He created in his image. We tell ourselves and others that the deceptions are for the purpose of good, for the building of God's kingdom. We're working hard. I mean, we're tired, you know? We want God's work to increase. He is, however, the God of truth, 
the God of light. There is no lie in him. His character and his work never include a deception, a lie, or a cover-up, because those things are utterly unlike him. We are never doing God's work when we pursue a seemingly godly goal by way of ungodly means. That's not possible. What we are doing is no longer godly, and neither are we. We are human beings, and we have a seemingly unlimited capacity to hide truths that are painful to us. We have an uncanny ability to push down or cover up knowing what, is in fa we, what, knowing what we in fact know. And we do so, at least initially, by <coughs> twisting the truth just a bit. The most powerful lie of all is a lie which contains a likeness to the truth in some way. As a result, self-deception can become the root of terrible evil. As Tim Keller, a pastor in Manhattan, said years ago in a sermon on Saul, Deception is not the worst thing you can do, but it is the means by which we do the worst things. Deception works on us little by little. We would not be deceived otherwise. There are a couple of scriptures, I think, that will help us in terms of this process of deception and its devastating results. If we go back to Jeremiah, verses we are familiar with, cursed is the person who trusts in mankind and makes flesh their strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For they will be like a bush in the desert, and they will not see when good comes. You see what the narcotic does? Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, and whose trust is the Lord. For they will be like a tree planted by the water. And of course it goes on to say, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? A deceived person trusts in something human for heart and soul sustenance to the extent that eventually we do not recognize when good truth and light come. We put our trust in humans for affirmation, for approval, for success and results, or we put our trust in things like alcohol, pornography, immorality, and we make those the places under which we actually shelter. Of course, our expectation of fulfillment then is continually frustrated because over time, convincing ourselves that what we're doing is for good, we, be, we will eventually lose our capacity to discern good from evil. And the result is that whoever feeds themselves in this way lives, as God says, in stony wastes and does not even see where they are anymore. It's quite terrifying if you really think about it. And it's in all of us. <laughs> in contrast, the one who trusts God to be his sustenance is not afraid when drought threatens, but somehow remains green and bears fruit. The process of deception is subtle and it paints a false color, cheating those who invest in such things and resulting in their ruin. Obviously, deceitfulness sits in all of our hearts. Anyone who's raised children knows the capacity for deception in humans, right? At a very early age, it shows up. <laughs> Lies, deception, and vulnerability are a terrible recipe. Without trust in our God, we will become what he hates. Obviously, deceitfulness resides in every human heart. And anyone, again, who raised children knows that. We also deceive ourselves by saying to ourselves things like, it will be good if I do this. I don't want to hurt God's name. We talk to ourselves that way. I know because people have told me how they talk to themselves when they're deceiving. But I don't want it to come out and I don't want to tell anybody because it will hurt God's name. In a twisted way, <laughs> it gives us hope. 
But deception deeply habituates the soul to look at things diametrically opposed to the way God sees them, for he is the God of truth. He does not deviate from truth ever. The truth about the little girl's life is that her parents are abusive and it's not her fault. The truth about the little girl who was hungry and wanted attention from the pastor was that she was hungry for good reasons and she needed to be fed good and true fruit. The art of self-deception is also our, about our ability to justify to ourselves what we're doing when we know it's wrong. You know, you speed only because you're late, right? <laughs> you speak harshly to somebody only because you had a bad day. That's not your fruit. I know speeding and harsh words are wrong, but I use external difficulties to convince myself of a justification for breaking the rules. It is painful for me to face and own my own wrongdoing. None of us likes that. So I administer the narcotic of deceit in order to avoid the sting of truth. Yes, you hear this frequently when you work with spouses who are abusive. I turned the table over and broke all the dishes because she didn't, she overcooked the meat and she knows how I like my meat. I mean, that's a really strange explanation, I know, except that I've heard it. <laughs> it's a real one. I'm abusive because he. I'm abusive because she. It's a statement diametrically opposed to the word of God. Jesus said, what comes out of me comes from my heart. It is an expose of my heart, not yours. Over time, the deception goes another step. And the, the, uh, the abuser uses deception to lure, to control victims. When you study the grooming of sexual predators, you see the ways in which abuse seduces the victim and the deceptions. That's the foundation for how abuse occurs. We saw that in our example with the youth pastor. The web of deception surrounding abuse and oppression is large. It can occur in an individual, it can occur in you and me, and it has. It can occur in an institution's life. It can be in a community life, and it can be in a nation. Corporations hide research data. Churches protect clergy who abuse or something like the Rwandan genocide. They're all examples of widespread deceptions that greatly impacted the church. I fear we often tend to select leaders in the Christian world according to gifting rather than character. Leadership in the body of Christ should not be based on gifting alone, but on spiritual maturity, on living in the truth, the fruit of which has been demonstrated over time, consistency over time. There have been some very immature teachers, leaders in the Christian world who have achieved power and statue, stat status because of their gifts rather than because of their maturity in Christ. We have watched large institutions, ones we believed successful and godly come apart when there is an expose of ungodly but successful leadership. When someone is particularly gifted ver uh, verbally and has a charismatic personality and is adept with spiritual language, it is very easy to assume spiritual maturity. However, spiritual maturity is measured by character. It is measured by the fruit of the spirit on a daily basis exhibited in someone's life. You think about Jesus and the enemy. It is written, if you throw yourself down, God will send his angels to protect you. The enemy used the words of God to tempt the Son of God. The ability to articulate theological truth does not mean that one is an obedient servant of God. Unfortunately, some use their abilities and theological knowledge to cover sin. Integrity of character, if integrity of character is not the marker, if likeness to Christ is not the marker, then gifts will easily seduce us. Listen, 
the ability to articulate theological truths does not necessarily mean that one is an obedient servant of our God. Unfortunately, the abilities and knowledge that bring ministry success easily become ego food. If integrity of character is not the measure of a leader, then we will be seduced by gifts. You see, the work of the church is not the call to ministry. That's really not, as important as that is. Spiritual success is never measured by human outcomes. Our true work is that of manifesting the likeness of Jesus Christ in the flesh in all things, whether it be success or failure, criticism or praise. If numbers, growth, praise, and fame were God's measure, then Jesus would be deemed a failure. Likeness to Christ is not measured by such external things. It is measured by the extent to which a person's character bears fruit that resembles the fruit of the Spirit, no matter the externals. That's not by numbers, my friends, or fame. It's by kindness and faithfulness. It is not by fame, but by humility and self-control. Jesus repeated over and over again, I always obey the Father. That was his primary mission, and it's supposed to be ours. We easily deceive ourselves and follow false ways. We follow a Christ made in our own image, one who agrees with us and would never want our temples to be destroyed. But this Jesus did not walk with Rome. He did not walk with temple leadership. He did not even walk with his own disciples when they failed to do the will of the Father. He said, I always do that which pleases the Father. Our call is to his likeness. It is to be seen in us who call ourselves his people, no matter the cost. It is my prayer that we will pay that cost and bring glory to his name.